Okay, um, six o'clock, so let's get started. Um, I'm Mike Klausner, I teach here in the law school, and on behalf of the law school and the Rock Center, I want to welcome all of you and introduce Anat Admati. So Anat is the George G.C. Parker Professor of Finance and Economics at the Business School here. She's written widely over her career in a, in a large number of areas of, of finance. Um, banking is just the most recent one, and at least from what I recall, maybe she hadn't written about banking even earlier in her career. That it's a, it's a new field uh, for her, perhaps. And um, I guess I should grab the book. She, she's here to talk about her book, The Banker's New Clothes, which is terrific. Um, this is a book that addresses the bankers and the bank lobbyists head on in their claim that they shouldn't have to raise capital, that they shouldn't have to raise equity, um, which they really should do. And what Anat does in this terrific way is apply rigorous economic theory to their claims in a very common sense and easy to understand manner. Some of my students today said they thought it was far easier to read than other things that I've assigned in my bank regulation course. Um, she, where the banker's arguments are nonsense, she says they're nonsense, and that's a quote. And it's a quote from many, many parts of the book. Um, and as far as I, my understanding of finance and economics and banking, she's absolutely right. So hopefully this book will have some influence. Uh, I was particularly interested in uh, when I first heard Anat give a talk about this book because early in my career when I was an associate in a law firm, I did this sort of work, bank regulatory work, and I've told Anat this story. I was in a meeting of Senate and House uh, staffers that were talking about the response to the SNL crisis, the SNL, what became known as the SNL bailout legislation. And the staffers, along with some of the partners in my firm, were talking about the cost of capital. And the capital is expensive. And this happened to be a question that kind of came out of the blue. It wasn't something we particularly prepared for. And I was thinking to myself, I wasn't long after out of college or law school at that point, and I remembered this thing called the Midigliani Miller irrelevancy hypothesis, and capital wasn't supposed to matter. So I piped up in this room full of 15 or 16 people. I said, well, wait a second. So the bankers claim capital is costly, but is there something different about banks? Because that's just not supposed to be true generally. Or what would the claim be? And the answer I got kind of anticipated what we hear today was something like, well, yeah, maybe, whatever, but banks are different. Um, so Anat has addressed that question specifically in a heading, uh, are banks different? And the only thing that I'll, I'll leave you with now is a question that a student uh, asked today in class. He's here, but I won't say who he is. He said, when the banks say this, are they being stupid or are they being deceptive? And I said, maybe Anat would help us understand uh, the answer to that question. So with that, I'll give you Anat. Thank you, Michael, and thanks for, for coming. Yeah, this was uh, one of the things that I was quite interested in, and a uh, number of times uh, people said to me, uh, who I know, well, colleagues saying or not, they don't understand. I was still shocked. I still am like, oh, oops. Sorry. Sorry, I'll start again. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. Um, so I've heard all kinds of things about what people know and what people want to know, and I don't really have an answer. I think it depends on, on, on who it is. Uh, there is an element here that maybe there are just entrenched confusions in banking. I don't know, but certainly people think and people say, you know, banks are all different, all different. Everything is different about banks. And uh, there are a few things that are just like almost physical laws that you just cannot really deny. Uh, 
and you just have to kind of put a person and say, you know, wait a minute, just precisely what is going to happen if you retain your earnings, you know, precisely how terrible would this be? Anyway, uh, this book came about because uh, after the financial crisis, I uh, just looked into banking because that was where the problems were. And so I started wondering what was going on. And the more I looked, the more disturbing everything was basically. So after a while, it became clear something was really wrong because we're talking about wrong in the textbooks of banking too. That was really kind of the moment where it was clearly wrong. And, uh, and there are many, many levels to it. But anyway, the book's title has three, really three parts to it. The bankers new clothes is sort of the flawed argument. So that's what we debunk. Uh, what's wrong with banking? is the reason that we had to write this book, because if it's just nonsense, that doesn't always matter. But some nonsense matter, and these nonsense matter because they happen to affect policy. So it's important to straighten out what's true and not true in this state. And also importantly, it's not like we're just having an academic debate. There's actually a policy question, and there's things to do, and they're not done. And so there's an action item, and a advocacy and a policy recommendation that we want to push. And that's why we wrote this book. We could not get through saying this uh, for, even though we've been at it, I was at it for more than a year, basically starting three years ago and ending uh, before going really in the bunker last summer, uh, where in the summer of 2011, it was basically clear I, there was just nothing to be done. I was told by somebody from this law school, uh, I'll be in great shape for the next crisis. I can say, I told you. Uh, so, uh, but, so that was basically giving up and going back to do my little models. Or going into the biggest teaching mode, uh, no prereqs. You know, I, I was talking to Arthur Levitt and he said that, uh, that his aunt Edna can read this book. So. That was a compliment I think it was meant to be. Because when we wrote this book, it was like I had this image that, that, that the reader is, is bored, is too complicated. And if we say that banking is easy, and then it's hard, then we lose. Because it's precisely what they want you to think. Very complicated. And it's not that complicated. Okay, so here's the assessment of what's wrong with banking. A lot is wrong. This is a really dangerous system and as an industry, it's a very unhealthy industry. A lot of things are wrong with it. It's very fragile and dangerous, meaning it's not resilient to downturns, to things going wrong. It has collateral damage, so it's not just that it's just within itself. It interacts with the rest of the economy and it can cause damage to the rest of the economy. So uh, you can have something break, but then it breaks and makes other people get hurt. And because of a combination of things, it creates a lot of distortions in the economy. The economy doesn't work as well. When this is sort of part of it, is sort of not a good part of the economy. In the heart of this, and a lot of my emphasis will be on governance. So this is a rock center of governance also uh, talk. And, and then really fundamentally at the heart of banking, our thesis is there's a big governance problem. And a governance problem arises when somebody makes decisions, impact other people, and they have no control over it. And so in banking, it's, it's very severe governance problem about who makes decisions and who wins and loses. Now, this is an industry where the, mar where the markets don't work. So I'll tell you how it fails to create an efficient outcome. So sometimes we don't need to do much in terms of regulation, but this system requires regulation to work. And it's not regulated effectively right now. So part of what's wrong is that it's not regulated effectively because it could work better, but it requires regulation to work better. So it doesn't, leaving it alone is not gonna work. As a result of all of this, it's just not a, a good part of the economy. It's a part of the economy that's not working well. The distortions and inefficiencies come in varieties that you may hear about. They kind of pop themselves as, for example, this too big to fail problem. So that just manifests itself as a problem that everybody thinks something's wrong with that. 
when the Attorney General says, now of course he wants to take it back, but when he says uh, that he thinks about the damage to the economy from prosecuting a bank, then, you know, I say they fail a basic stress test. We can't have, and it pushes everybody's button in the political system, which is good because it alerts them to the fact that there is a problem, that we can't have above the law corporations or people in this country or in any country. It's a very bad situation. Something's wrong with it. How can we get in a situation where uh, you can't prosecute somebody? Uh, and uh, you, you know, there are lots of things that are wrong with it being too big to fail, and it's not just being big. It's the point about that is that when uh, a, a particular institution is to fail, that it gets scary enough that it gets prevented. And that was AIG, for example, it doesn't even have to be a bank, it doesn't even have to be that big, uh, but it is somehow not allowed to fail. What I'm gonna emphasize is something that's a little less visible than this. Part of the inefficiency of this is the fact that the banks are not making efficient lending decisions and efficient investment decisions. They either lend too much or too little. So they can get distressed and then they stop lending and there's a credit crunch. Of course, they'll blame the regulation, they'll blame all kinds of things, but fundamentally the credit crunch happens when they get into trouble. And that's not the way they want you to think about it. But, and sometimes they lend too much. So they lend too much maybe to homeowners, maybe they lend too much to, to governments in Europe right now. So the lending is somehow not appropriate, uh, not the right lending, because we always say credit is great and all of that, but not every loan in the economy needs to be made. You need to fund the productive activities at the right price that are kind of good activities to, to fund, and that's where banks can come in and help the economy. Otherwise, if they just hedge funds, anybody can do that. Anybody can start a hedge fund and do that, but we don't need the banks to do those things. So the governance problem come from the fact that managers in the banks on the ground, this is a governance problem, every corporation has some governance problems, but usually they're between shareholders and managers. You'd say, does the manager work for the shareholders? Do they steal the money, whatever? Here, the problem is more about risk. The managers decide to take risk, London way, whatever, and then who benefits and who loses from that? So the managers do the best, basically. After them come the shareholders. The shareholders get thrown a bone in the good days, dividends, other things. So they get some of the upside of the risks that are taken. Creditors, if they're depositors and are protected or have collateral or something, they're kind of indifferent to the risk. And then what's the backstop? Usually the public with deposit insurance, somebody else bears the downside or at least gets impacted, whether they directly bear it or not. So there's collateral damage. What to do? Well, the two, two particular things people have focused on is sort of trying to let them fail, trying to find a way that we can stand to let them fail. So we replace the bankruptcy process with a different process called the resolution, and we try to do better than bankruptcy because bankruptcy for banks just doesn't work very well. Airlines go in and out of bankruptcy uh, all the time, but for banks it's very, Difficult for various reasons that I want to go into, but the, and I'm involved with this effort and there are other efforts along the way to kind of make it work that they could fail. Failure involves a legal issue about priorities and how to resolve it. It's a very messy project, uh, 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 process for banks, especially because a lot of their debt is very short term and so it's a very messy situation. The problem with the resolution as a solution to the, pro to the problem of banking is it's too late and it's very complicated cross-border, impossible almost. So for global banks, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work because the legal regimes are very different and when corporations die, they die legally in different countries. And that is just, there's no loss sharing. Then there's, there's attempts to do it with UK now and all of that. But fundamentally, when I ask, okay, when does this get triggered? It's a messy political issue about triggering the systemic resolution and who's going to dare to do that. And uh, it's supposed to be imminent default and it's legally challenged and it's complicated. But fundamentally, the problem with it, it's too late. It's too late. By then, 
whatever you do in the best of all world is gonna not be good. So can you prevent it? In other words, this is like think of accidents and you're putting ambulances by the roadside. Can you put a speed limit? That kind of question, okay? Uh, so the other thing people talk about is sort of breaking them up or changing the activities or splitting them into different, in different kinds of way. And that, and there's ring fencing and vocal rule and others, so controlling what they do. And that's, again, the problem with it is very hard to do. It's hard to do because part of the problem is not about size, it's about interconnectedness. So if everybody fights at the same time, you still have a problem. The savings and loan were small. Were small, some of the banks in, in, uh, the banks in Spain were small. So it's, if they all fail at the same time, they all make the same investment or they, they are interconnected in a way that one failure leads to others, then it's not about the size. Is it about the activity? Well, it's not about taking deposits because Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers were not deposit-taking institutions. So they were, they were outside, they were investment banks and yeah, they caused damage. So it's hard to say who's systemic. It's not, it doesn't come with a label like that. So it's all very difficult. The Volcker rule was one of these attempts to say, okay, you can't do proprietary trading, but of course then they gave him so many exemptions that they can't make this work at all. And they, you know, for any regulation you have to think about just <coughs> implementing it, who's gonna actually do the work. And it just gets to be some cost benefit there that you know, what do you get at what cost? So it becomes complicated. So the question is, is there anything more to do? Well, here's something to do, something simple to do that prevents distress and default, which means you borrow less. One of the, a lot of what this book is about is about narratives. After the crisis, people like to tell a story about the crisis, and there were lots of stories. This is sort of my entry point into this. What happened, because I was not into banking and I didn't know much about it, but I know finance and I know economics, so I started reading what happened, all the different stories people were telling. And some of the stories were kind of focusing on breakdowns and runs, and it was sort of the image was of, of a natural disaster. Something happened, it was a confluence of things, and you know, now everything's fine, we saved you, and you know, the, we came to the rescue, and it could have been worse. And that's the story that they want to tell you that also is a convenient narrative because then you don't have to ask how we got to that point and why it, the risks build up and all of that. So it's false to give the analogy of a natural disaster. It's not like a natural disaster. This is not a nature thing. Uh, the fragility of the banks, the, of this system, at least the level of this fragility is not essential and only harmful, actually. So you can reduce it dramatically. I'm not gonna eliminate it, but even when they say banks have always been fragile, the answer is banks probably were never efficient. <clears throat> never, even when before they could get so big and so scaled up that they could devour entire economies. So just because there have always been banking crises and banks are always living on the edge, doesn't mean that banks were ever healthy in terms of the overall efficiency, okay? And, and again, I'll go track back to a fundamental conflict of interest at the heart of banking. And it's the borrower-creditor conflict that controls uh, about just about everything you see in banking. Uh, so there's nothing that banks do that justifies that they are so fragile as they are and cannot actually bear their own losses so easily uh, uh, breaking up. And I'm saying failing. Uh, and here is the preventative measure. If you were to ask the banks to fund with less debt and more equity, and we're talking about banks taking funding most of their uh, investments with making promises, legal promises, I'll show you uh, in a second. Uh, just about everything you can think about, unless you're a banker or have some other flawed story, is good, everything from society's perspective, okay? You can reduce the likelihood of distress or failure, you can reduce the contagion effect because oftentimes the contagion effects uh, come from the fact that if I fail, I weaken my counterparty and then they fail or if I have to sell assets and everybody uh, starts selling at the same time, you can have weaknesses that contagion or, uh, or I infer from one company to another. So this whole notion of everybody, of everybody failing at the same time gets reduced when you're when you can 
sort of trust more that nobody there is gonna, is gonna default on you. Uh, too big to fail subsidies that are basically delivered through cheap uh, borrowing rates are, are reduced because you're, you're basically preventing them from using, uh, from accessing the cheap funding of debt. Uh, and the downside risk gets shift, shifts to, to, to being together with the upside. So the owners, shareholders that get the upside also bear more losses. Uh, and all the other things. So when you look at the cost benefit of this from society's perspective, you get an amazing situation. You get all these benefits at no cost to society. It's really remarkable. It's like the most no-brainer reform you can think about. And yet, it's so poorly understood that this is like the, the, the one thing you have to do no matter what else you do. If it's not enough, well, maybe you have to do more. But you certainly have to do some of that. Because here's what we're talking about. Now, this is something that people don't understand, don't have in their heads. And that's why part of the confusion is, so we need to talk about something called the balance sheet. Now, I don't want to put accounting numbers on it. Balance sheets are usually accounting. But just conceptually, that, that there are basically two things to think about. What the banks do and how the banks get the money to do what they do. Okay? So on this side is what they do. And on this side is how they fund. So, uh, so what they do is they have some cash reserves. They invest in all kinds of things. They make some loans. That's their investments. This is the invest, and people pay them back or they get returns on their investment, or if it's cash, it's, it's cash. Here is how they fund. Deposits. We give them money, they owe it to us. That's part of their debt, okay? So all the money that we use for payment and all this money creation, it's their debt. Whatever the story you tell about banking, there's still a balance sheet. It's still a corporation. And then there are thousands of other ways that they borrow and then at the top there are the equity claims, meaning the residual. If you were to liquidate everything today, what's going to be left? So we start in the house, the house, the mortgage, the equity. That's where people meet the word equity for the first time. Here's the thing about debt. This is a law school. It's a legal claim. It's a legal claim that takes priority. Stuff happens if you don't pay. Uh, creditors don't take losses easily. It requires a legal process, it requires negotiation, something. So they are entitled to this. They're protected by the contracts. We had, um, uh, we, we had uh, the talk on governance uh, by, by uh, Meyer, and you know, this, this came up. It's one of the constituencies, one of the stakeholders, they got their contract. Now, one, I'm leaving the assets the same here, but one way to make the bank safer is to take some of the debt and replace it with equity. Funding. Now, is this debt part of the business of bank? Not necessarily. A lot of the banks borrowing is just the way they want to fund, the way they prefer to fund. Some of it is all kinds of bonds that they give us. Some of it is even overnight or whatever. They'll tell you it's all essential, but then they can also increase their equity. So we, we can talk about that. One of the most insidious mistakes around, which gets you completely in the wrong debate, entirely wrong debate and the entirely wrong side of the balance sheet is the language that is used. Instead of using the word equity, they use the word capital. Capital often is an asset. It's used in many ways in economics. And then they attach to it the verb hold or set aside. And then they say set on the sidelines and they give analogies of rainy day fun. All of a sudden, the debate is about how much cash reserves they should have. But that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, so the capital is not a rainy day fund. You'll find this in the best of news stories from Gretchen Morganson and Sorkin and people like that still giving that analogy. You'd find a whole story about the brown Vitter law that's now on the table that tells you how 15% reserve is not gonna help us. It's not what the debate is about at all. This is how crazy this gets. Uh, so we're not even at the starting point of what to do when we're talking about how much cash reserves they have. Now, they might have regulation on reserves, but reserves is not going to help you unless it's really high and the money is sitting idle. Potentially in cash, maybe in earning interest, maybe not, but it can't be lent. But sure, if you have only 3%, and if all your money, your assets are committed to, to, uh, to debt, think of a mortgage uh, or put no down payment in, 
then a little bit of a drop in the price and you're underwater. That's what homeowners found out in the crisis that, uh, that they owed more than the house was worth. That's being underwater, that's being insolvent, okay? So this confusion is insidious and it's all over the, this notion if you hear, they say capital reserves and whenever the journalists report about capital, they always make it sound like it's money set aside. It's not set aside, it's invested, it's, it's a down payment, it's equity money, all the companies in the Valley fund this way, and they're not holding the money aside. Apple doesn't hold the equity that, it's the investors that have a piece of paper that entitles them to this, but the company does not hold its own funding. The company holds assets, it's the wrong verb altogether, it's a passive word, it's not appropriate for how a company funds. So this is just, kind of a nonsensical starting point, but you'll have lobbying documents that say, oh, this sucks money out of the economy. Having more equity requirement takes money out of the economy, sucks away resources that can't be used. That's just nonsense. That is nonsense, complete and utter nonsense. This makes no sense about the meaning of the word. So here is how equity works. You can have a little bit of it, or you can have more of it with the same assets. These are just ways to fund. Okay, here's the more like the banks, okay? Single digit, okay, I'll show you the stats. Now watch it, because I have, oops. Uh, that's my little, uh, little Pac-Man. <laughs> uh, so the Pac-Man ate some of the assets. The bank lost, okay? So this is all conceptual, whether they recognize in accounting a whole other can of worms, but, uh, but there was a loss, something bad happened, okay? Well, the debt's still there. That's the point about debt, okay? It, you still owe it. Who's gonna absorb those losses? Well, obviously, equity will, and so it shrunk over there, not so much over here, because there was more of it to begin with. Now, what should, at this point, people start wondering, is it solvent or not? Solvent is a very complicated concept, because it's got to be do with the ability to pay, even though you may or may not default quite yet. But you can be in this zombie state, that's what happened to savings and loans for a while, and then they can run a muddle along and they won't quite default, but they're weak. You know, if, if you had to look at them, they might be even not having enough assets there. Should the bank lose some more, oops, now it might be insolvent. Now still, it might live. We have a lot of zombie banks in Europe right now, and maybe we have a few in this country, despite what they tell you. Uh, that, you know, they live only on subsidies, or they, they are actually, if you looked at all the loans, they actually are not very healthy. At this point, well, uh, the bank again might muddle along, but it's gonna be very difficult for it to function. It's gonna be difficult for it to continue paying its debt, to continue making loans. It's becoming kind of constrained. Or it might be tempted, if it really thinks it's gonna to fail, to you know, put all the money on a roulette, and then maybe it could pay. So that's the gambling for resurrection that you could get. Uh, when, you're, when you're distressed, you might also have incentive to take the money out, just like before bankruptcy, on and on and on. Basically, if the control remains with the borrower, the borrower becomes highly conflicted with the creditors, basically the creditors' money, at that point that they're playing with. They might be tempted to do all kinds of things, take out the money, take second mortgage, take dividends out, all of that. The stress in the banks creates damage for the economy, so much so that you might restore them and give them top money and replenish them and hope that they keep functioning for the economy. Look at my bank that had more equity. It didn't need bailouts. It still has equity, etc. simple. Now, historically, banks did not this is the equity level in banks, sort of going back to the end of the 19th century. If you go farther back, banks were partnerships with unlimited liability for the owner, and they had to have 50% equity or depositors wouldn't trust them with their money. So before the days of deposit insurance and central banks and all the different support that the banks had, they, people would only give them money if they put their own uh, money at risk as well. This is a mess that we're gonna keep your money in a safe deposit box, like a suitcase that you give in the, in the train station, okay? So if they go play with it, uh, now the word bankruptcy, by the way, comes from bancarota. So this is basically 
shows you the helplessness of the depositors once we got into this payment system business, that if the banker, if the, you came for your money and the money wasn't there, you, all you could do was break the bench of the banker. Uh, so, uh, so the banker always wanted to play just a little bit too much with the depositor's money and put just, to, just as little as they could get away with of their own money at risk. So over the years, what happened, so even in the US before the, the deposit insurance was introduced, uh, the shareholders of banks didn't even have limited liabilities in every state. Some of them had sort of double liability, triple liability, or unlimited liability depending on the state. And that means that, that if the bank couldn't pay the debt, including the deposits, then you, had, you could go after the shareholders for more money. Of course, we don't have that now in the, in the stock markets as corporations have limited liability. So uh, shareholders cannot lose more. So basically having more equity means having more liability in the corporation, even though it's not individual shareholders that have, that have liability beyond what they invested. So they can only pay what the corporation pays. That's basic corporate, uh, corporate law. Uh, but over the years, uh, especially after many uh, bank owners went bankrupt in the depression, but it still didn't help because still many banks failed in the depression, uh, they established deposit insurance. The deposit insurance was meant to keep depositors uh, sort of calm and happy and, and secure that their money is safe and they will be paid. And so it's an insurance fund that the banks pay a little bit of a premium for. FDIC insured, all the banks are FDIC insured. And in this country, the system has worked very well. Small banks get, you know, over a weekend, you know, get taken over if they fail and, and all of that. But from that, from having central banks that give the banks sort of liquidity support or they are lenders of last resort, meaning if the bank sort of can't pay, then they'll sort of give the, the central bank collateral and the bank will give them cash. Uh, from all of that, the banks became able and interested in reducing the amount of equity and relying more and more on debt for their funding. And so the equity levels just got into the single digits. And so the levels that we have gotten to is just what they got used to. There's nothing about it that was essentially just they could, they wanted to and they could uh, do that. And so they, they, they became used to kind of living on, on six to 8% equity. You don't find corporations like that in the rest of the economy without any regulation. You don't find them. Uh, the facts are, Corporations can grow without borrowing. Every corporation, even bank. So yes, banks are different because some of their businesses is taking debt, like deposits. So start with that. But there's nothing preventing them from retaining their earnings and building up and putting more owner to back it up. Whatever they do with it, even if they just put it, you know, in, in, in treasuries or whatever, they can back up their own their own liabilities on their own. They just don't want to. Uh, is a problem uh, in the economy. Most companies, the first source of funding is retained profits. That's Warren Buffett, successful investor, never pays out anything. The stock price goes up, he keeps the money, he wants the investors to trust him with the money. And so the banks will tell you they must return capital, return capital, it's just the, their ability, their desire to keep being indebted, to replace that money with debt and get rid of the perfectly good equity that's already there in terms of the fact that these are dollars that they made that they're not committed to paying back. It's rare for non-banks to have less than 30% equity. Uh, in fact, in the economy, uh, in the US economy where equity markets are very developed also, uh, by market value co corporations have 70% on average, but it varies greatly. Many high tech companies don't bother to borrow at all. Of course, if they did, they'll get some tax kick and all of that. In any case, uh, that's that. Well, how much equity? Uh, the requirements are as follows. Leading up to the crisis, they, uh, in some countries, and in some banks in this country, but not all, fortunately, uh, Basel II agreement, an international agreement, was, was in effect. This Basel is a minimum requirement agreed by the G20 now, whatever, and they have to still implement it every country. The requirement in Basel II was 2%. And it's not even 2% of the total. This is 2% of something called risk-weighted assets. So some assets are just ignored, so sort of as very safe or given a low weight. 
And so you get a smaller number as a denominator. And so 2% of that could be like half percent of the total or something like that. This means that the bank is entirely funded with, with debt. No wonder it's very fragile. It can't take any loss without getting running into trouble. Uh, Basel III, the new reform that's very tough, the banks will tell you, uh, asks them to remain in the range between 4.5% and 7% of so-called risk-weighted assets. And I'll show you in a second what, what that means. Uh, and before this, there wasn't any requirement before, 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 until Basel III on the total, so equity to total. Basel III, big innovation that the governments in Europe don't like uh, because they want the banks to lend to them only with board money, uh, is 3%. 3% equity to total. That's like buying a, a $300,000 house with uh, well, whatever is 3% uh, of that $9,000 uh, in, in, in down payment. Okay, But this is not an individual board. This, there's, these are corporations that can print up pieces of paper and sell them to investors and get more equity at appropriate prices. There, among the many months I spent on this, I read every paper that was supposedly justifying scientifically these numbers, and they're all flawed completely. Uh, so there are many, many flaws in them. This is Martin Wolf, among the smartest uh, people around, commenting on uh, how tough these requirements are, tripling. They always tell you how much it's more than before, and it's a fraction of what it was before. But we know that uh, you know zero times a lot is still zero. So therefore, if you start with a really small number and you triple it, it's still a very small number. So the comparison to the numbers before is only a reflection of how ridiculous numbers before were, and not about where you should be or can be or uh, or, or what's good. So the benchmarks are completely different and completely wrong. He also said because the adjustment period in Basel was till 2019. He said in 2010, when this just came out, that uh, by 2019 we'll have a few more crises. And he was right, because we followed straight into the crisis in Europe, which includes in, uh, within it a big banking crisis, too. So the banks there keep, keep running into trouble. So here's sort of a, a visual for all of this. So here's the bank. And you know the bank does lots of things, but we want the bank uh, to make loans. Suppose that's kind of the investments we care about. Now, the bank can fund this with equity or with debt and put it in the deposit, so that's there. But uh, beyond that, um, it can do all kinds of more things in terms of what it raises money for and what it does. And here is the river of the economy. The more debt as a fraction of the total, the more it pollutes the system because of the interconnectedness. In other words, it creates systemic risk. It creates inefficiencies that harm other people. So the more they choose that, the more harmful they are. Now, what ends up happening is we have a most perverse system in which, partly for absolutely no good reason at all, uh, and partly because we, because of the collateral damage of the fall, we subsidize and encourage uh, borrowing. And sure enough, they respond to it, works for them, and rightly so. So I don't blame anybody for responding. I am talking about setting the incentives before them. We have a tax code that makes absolutely no sense, and every committee on banking, on uh, on taxes, has always pointed this out. This was written. It, it, almost accidentally into the corporate tax law, which is a, a relatively new thing in the world. And it was written in such a way, corporate tax law, that interest payments are tax deductible, like an expense. But this is an, a funding expense, and it ends up penalizing equity funding relative to that funding. So it's like deductibility of mortgage. You not only encourage uh, subsidize home ownership, but you subsidize borrowing to buy a home. So you could give somebody a lump sum, but the, the more subsidies they get, the more, the more they borrow, the more they subsidies they get. So they save on taxes as they choose more, more debt in the mix. So it encourages this polluting way of funding, which is like subsidizing pollution when you have a clean alternative. Now, of course, there's the implicit guarantees. The implicit guarantees come in and, and destroy the market for credit, because if you think of other corporations, other corporations, uh, why don't they borrow more? When we teach corporate finance, we say, oh, borrowing 
uh, has a tax advantage. So therefore, you should borrow as much as you can. But what's going to push back? Well, the creditors are going to push back because they're going to start worrying about the bankruptcy costs, not the fact of the bankruptcy, but the deadweight cost of bankruptcy, the legal costs, the loss of, of efficiency, the, all the investments you, all the bad investments you will make and the good investment that you won't make, and all the other things will end up worrying the creditors, and they're going to start putting covenants, and they're going to start putting conditions. You can't take the money out. You can't, uh, uh, you can't take too much risk. You can't merge. You can't do this without permission. So there are lots of, the contracts get complicated, and the creditors increase uh, the, the interest rate they charge because they're worried about being harmed. And so that's why even though we don't regulate, we don't ever find companies going to high uh, leverage or high indebtedness. Uh, they just find out that it just becomes harder and harder to borrow uh, as you become very indebted and that you end up paying more and constraining yourself and, become, and getting stuck in this distress situation. It's very unhealthy. And so most companies don't do this. For the banks, all the traders go out the window. They don't pay their own bankruptcy costs. Their creditors don't worry about it. And their creditors always find all these ways to protect themselves. So depositors don't care about anything. because So who cares about risk for these corporations? Nobody, not enough people in the market care about their risk. For other corporations, their investors care about their risk. At least the creditors certainly do. And for the banks, each creditor finds a way to just be paid. So there could be depositors that are insured, then they don't worry about anything. Or they have all these other ways. They get into a sort of a, a maturity rat race. Because a way to convince somebody to lend to you is, is to say, OK, you come first. You take the money first. So it's shorter and shorter maturity effectively uh, harms the previous creditors or the longer term creditors. Because, and so the, you, the question you, you stop and ask yourself is, how does anybody get to borrow so much? How do they ever get so indebted? How, does, how do the creditors agree? Well, obviously, if you're too big to fail, or even if you are part of a system that won't be allowed to fail in certain situations, the creditors uh, know that, they, that you know, most likely they will be paid, or maybe for sure they'll be paid. Somehow or other, the promise will be fulfilled. And so they don't worry as much about it like normal creditors would. And therefore, they don't push back on this uh, indebtedness. And the banks get to, just like Fannie and Freddie got to borrow at subsidized rate and grew, obviously, all kinds of perverse incentives come in because these are the kinds of subsidies that you get from cheap funding that now you can just grow and grow and grow. The more you grow, the more risk you take, the bigger the value of the subsidies. So you basically, these are subsidies you can increase at will. As a result of the subsidies, the banks choose a lot of debt and very little equity and pollute more. So that's the race they're in. They are in the race to take more and more advantage of these subsidies and then who pays for the subsidies and who cleans up? Well, I mean, it's the rest of us, obviously. So it's an incredibly perverse system, really. Uh, do they pass the subsidies down? <coughs> Not clear. Uh, they certainly take off the top. But the thing is that the subsidies are just blanket subsidies to their funding. They'll lend if they want to lend. JP Morgan Chase went to play in London well, with excess deposit money. So there's no problem with money. They got plenty of money. They have, JP Morgan Chase has $1.1 trillion of deposits and only lends $700 billion. But the balance sheet of JP Morgan Chase is $2.2 trillion by US accounting standards. And if they were reporting in Europe, they'd be over $4 trillion. $4 trillion. It depends on how you do derivative accounting. That's a whole other thing. But this is an enormous, enormous, enormous corporation. Did you know that the biggest 80, 80 corporations in the world, so if you go down size of assets in the world, all are financial institutions. So they control lots of assets. And some of it is just their indebted, their, their noddedness, because the borrowing and lending into one another and the derivatives and all of that is, is just and not. So they, they become very exposed to one another all the time. Very difficult system. Do we get cheap credit? What should be the cost of credit? Why should any particular investment making loans be treated differently than other investments? Investments are made in the economy at the appropriate costs that depend on the investment, that depend on interest rates, that depend on things. 
So there's no reason to, to, to say anything. Here's sort of the big conflict of interest. The way bankers look at it, and whether they look at it from the shareholder's perspective is not always clear, is debt is always good for them. Sort of the marginal, sort of the next dollar is they want to get it by making a promise. They get tax subsidies, they get safety net benefits, they are fixed their own return on equity. That's a whole sickness in banking, this fixation about returns. You can't get returns without risk, and you can get returns by taking risk being inefficient. So we have a whole chapter on that. It has to do with governance. It proxies for what's sick about bank is this return chasing. This just taking risk per se, seeming like a business model that is not a business model in the economy, just taking risk unless somebody bears a downside, which seems to be the business model in banking. In other words, take risk and let somebody else bear a downside almost captures what's going on. Now none of these, and then they have a debt overhang effect. The debt overhang effect basically means that once you are, that leverage borrowing has a certain addictive properties. Once you borrow a lot, you become part of the conflict of interest with the creditors is that you want to keep taking risk and that includes keep borrowing. Because if you are to start putting your money, you're giving a gift to the creditor at your expense. So you don't want to make if you, for example, if you lost a lot on a house, if you invest a lot, that makes your creditor uh, better because they'll be more likely to be paid. And so if you're about to, uh, so, so you won't usually invest in a house or so make, make the creditor safer at your own expense if you could do that, but you might increase your indebtedness. You might take a second mortgage that exposes your, your creditor already agreed on the terms to more risk. So it's part of the conflict of interest that you will take more risk is that you will continue to fund in ways that are riskier, which is b more boring, because boring magnifies the risk. None of the reasons that banks love to borrow justify their borrowing from society's perspective. So none of this is, has to do with efficiency. It's very inefficient. For society, it would be much better if they chose much more equity and less debt, so that they got funding by uh, if, if they're a viable corporation anyway, by retaining their earnings or raising more equity and uh, therefore backing up uh, all their debts, whether they're useful debts like deposits or other debts. So all these benefits come in. So now comes starts the nonsense in the banker's new clothes. And so the lot of the book is sort of in a negative way. You say this, and what's wrong with it? I wouldn't have to write this if you didn't say it. So that's the problem, and they just keep coming, and they keep saying it. So right now we're preparing yet another document, and this goes back to many writings in the last three years. Another thing, the parade continues, 20 claims debunked that we're still hearing, and, and now I was just talking to somebody today, and he said, oh, but make sure to talk about Coco's. Did you do that? I was like, oh. You know, I, I don't, I like 20, now I rearrange them. Including, you know, level playing field and competitiveness and, you know, all of that. And we can, go, some of them are not specifically on banking. But here is the classic. So I read a book uh, that came right after we uh, finished writing a book called the Payoff. The Payoff, Why Wall Street Always Wins. This was written by uh, Jeff Connaughton, who was uh, working with uh, B Joe Biden, and then he worked with Senator Kaufman. And Senator Kaufman was a unique senator because uh, he was not running for re-election. Therefore, he didn't care about campaign donations. That makes him very unique in this country. And um, so he fought, and he didn't care uh, to, get, uh, uh, to get conflicted with the banks. Uh, and Jeff also was a lobbyist for a while, so he knew D.C. very well. D.C. is where Senator Durbin said in 2009 uh, that the bankers, frankly, that Wall Street owns the place, that's what he said. Now, in the book, Jeff Connaughton uh, relates a conversation between Ted Kaufman, the senator, uh, who replaced Joe Biden for two years in the Senate, um, and Paul Volcker, in which Paul Volcker uh, says to a Kaufman, uh, anytime you're gonna do something, the banks are always gonna say that credit will suffer and growth will suffer and the economy will suffer, whatever you say. And then he paused and said, that's BS, that's what he said. When I tried to get Paul Volcker to endorse my book, I said, after reading this, I said, can you just say my book explains why it's BS? Uh, anyway, 
Uh, so here's the, the classic lobbying line that resonates with among a number of others that resonate with politicians. More equity might increase, this is already we're on the right side of the balance sheet, so that's good, uh, might increase the stability of banks. At the same time, it would restrict their ability to provide loans to the rest of the economy. This reduces growth and has negative effects for all. This is Joseph Ackermann. This is sort of the, the Jamie Dimon of Germany uh, for a while. Uh, the leading banker and lobbyist uh, that speaks up uh, always. And that was sort of a classic line that he used. And here's my edit. Uh, Well-designed capital regulation that requires much more equity will increase the stability of banks and it will enhance their ability to provide good loans, appropriate loans, to the rest of the economy. They will be less likely to take excessive risk and less likely to uh, have a, a sort of have a credit crunch where they don't want to fund loans. Uh, and it will remove significant distortions. It may reduce the growth of banks. However, it will have a positive effect for all, except maybe a few bankers. So basically, this system really works for very few people and harms a lot of people. And then the rest is just the confusions that they've created about it, uh, about why it has to be this way. Uh, what should we do now? Do we have a chapter about what to do now? It's called If Not Now When, and the epigraph of this chapter is time has a trick of getting rotten before it gets ripe. Uh, and so they always say not now, not now. Now it's crisis and now it's good and now never at the time. Not the time. Now is not the time, they say. When we say the opposite, we say now is precisely the time and especially, in fact, when some banks are unhealthy and sick, it's exactly the time to clean it out now. In Europe, there are a lot, so situations where a lot of banks are sick and not functioning is not helping. And so denying losses and just is not helpful. The banks in the US don't want to renegotiate mortgages in part because they don't want to recognize their losses, especially on second mortgages. So second mortgages that banks gave a lot are total loss for many of these bankers, but they don't want to. So they keep them on the books and they refuse to negotiate. This is why you have eminent domains and other people coming in to try to get the foreclosures uh, done, forget also the, the documents and all the other stuff. But I mean, they're inefficient on the, on the small scale, so the, the homeowners are suffering, the banks not. So recognizing the losses is very important, and in Europe you have a lot of sick banks, more than in the US, but some our banks are not as healthy as they want you to believe. Uh, and and there, there's some claim, maybe they've been nursed back to life, that, you know, City and Bank of America, should you actually remove the subsidies and sort of ask them to, to live on their, more on their own, that they're actually insolvent zombie banks. Uh, how do you build up the equity? How do you strengthen the banks right away? You ban the payouts. The payouts of the dividends are entirely unnecessary. This money is already there and doesn't need to be raised. It just needs to stay there, do anything but pay it out. So, you know, if they are going to burn it, then well, let's keep it for them. But it's backing up there and making them more able to, uh, to withstand uh, uh, any downturn and continue to function. Uh, if there are, especially if there are viable banks that uh, have uh, publicly traded stocks, they can issue more stocks. They won't like the price. They'll tell you all about how they deserve to have their book value, all kinds of other nonsense. But uh, there's a proper price. Anybody who, who has little equity won't be able to borrow and will have to go to the markets and face the investors. If they can't face the investors, if nobody will give the money at all, not a lot of money, not as much as they like, but any money, then they're probably zombies. Why is that that they can't raise money? Do they have a business? What's their business? That's what you have to ask. How can you have a business in the economy that can't live uh, with 20% equity? So what's wrong with their business then? Could they only live on subsidies or are they able to actually live with 20% equity uh, or 30% equity? Well, why not? Well, if they don't have a business, we want to know about this. If they can only live on subsidies, what's the business of intermediation? In any case, you know, lending is only a small part of what they do. So let's not get too scared of that. Here's the ultimate stress test. If you really can't raise, and any money you raise is a too big to fail bank, and I'm not talking about you know, raising money from Warren Buffett in exchange for 9% promises and warrants and other things. 
uh, and in exchange for cheering for you later on. Uh, but, you know, common equity, because I want much more of the simplest, plainest thing. No substitutes are good, because any substitute to equity at all creates these overhangs, where the decision maker kind of that needs enough upside to make the investment. That's not healthy. So uh, I I any equity that they raise, if they're too big to fail bank, will still have subsidies built into it. Because if the shareholders think they'll never be wiped out, then they'll pay more. If they can't raise like, equity at any price, that's the ultimate stress test. Then something's wrong with them. Then we want to know what it is. Maybe they're just too opaque. Maybe they're hiding their risk when uh, when uh, Jesse Eisinger and, and uh, Frank Parknoy went to look at West Fargo Bank, they found out that even West Fargo was difficult to figure out. And that's not as complicated a bank as the three others that are really busy, very active in derivatives markets where you'd see even less what's going on. So there's a lot of opacity in all of this. This also increases the fragility of this system. Where to go? You go to a much different place. Much different place. You have to build it up and you have to transition uh, properly, but there's no reason to stay where we are, uh, whatever else, else you do. And if that shrinks the, the size of the industry, this industry is probably bloated and probably has excess capacity. And that's part of the problem that it has is that when, you, when there's not enough money to be made, then the competition becomes so fierce that, uh, that uh, they actually must take risk to survive almost. So it, it's good to find out who's really unhealthy there and basically remove them from the market to sell what's there and kind of unwind them uh, in an orderly fashion now. And then, you know, have a few healthy, you have healthy banks that can function, you know, compete with one another or whatever, but they can actually function and live and make loans and, and whatever and bear their own losses a lot more than they do right now. The sad situation is that there's a lot of talking about reform, but it's just a mess of a reform. There's just so much politics in this and so much lobbying and so, it's so inefficient, the process, and some of these regulations are not that, that sensible. And they're also very costly. For example, they have this thing called living wills. So the banks are gonna write down how you will un unwind them. Now it sounds fine, except it's not cheap to do. They have to employ armies of people to write these things. Then the regulators have to have armies of people checking them. And then what if they're not good? Then by the time they figure that out, it's already time for another one of those things. And so, okay, so what's the incentive of the bank to give you a really good plan to unwind them under bankruptcy code? That's what they ask you to do. I mean, this is not a situation where this is for my relatives, you know, after I die. You know, this is a corporation, you know, with, with people who, who couldn't care less what, like, that, to, to, make, to make a good resolution. Uh, there's a lot of politics in banking. So we have a whole chapter on politics because there's no talking about banking without talking about politics. So it's, 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 uh, it's very political in banking. Basically what happens is, you know, the, the robber was asked, you know, why did you rob the bank? And the answer was, because banks are where the money is. So a lot of industries uh, lobby, but banks are particularly uh, intertwined with politicians because politicians always have ideas what banks should do with their money. And so oftentimes it's to lend to favorable causes or to lend to the government itself. That's a big one in Europe right now. And so, uh, you know, here's Cyprus for you. Cyprus is very simple to understand. Cyprus banks, one, first of all, they were admitted to the euro in 2008 uh, at the urging of Greece. Uh, and so as soon as they became part of the euro, which was early 2008, um, they wanted to, be very, to have a very successful banking system. We had countries that wanted to have successful banks like Iceland and uh, et cetera, and we saw how that ended. So in Cyprus, they wanted to be a financial center and they had some tax laws and other things, and they got all, they attracted all these Russian investors and, and all that, and they promised 4 or 5% interest on deposits. This is very high, especially nowadays, it's very high. In the last few years, they were still promising that. Of course, you can't deliver that without taking risks, so what did they do? They went to lend to the government of Greece, and uh, the government of Greece's debt was, once it became clear that they were very heavily indebted and might not be able to pay, had to promise a lot of interest because that's what happens when you're a risky borrower. And so there was a great spread to be had, right? We can all get to be such bankers to, you know, promise 
you know, three, four, five percent and get 15 percent for a while, as long as it works. Uh, of course, you don't get 15 percent without taking a risk that you might not be paid, and sure enough, uh, they uh, were not paid in full for the, from Greece. And at some point, even after passing a stress test that wasn't that stressful, uh, obviously, a few months afterwards, they had to you know, write down that to take a loss of 75% on all their investment in Greek debt. Now, this, by the regulation, was considered a safe investment. 15%, like junk, and the regulation considers it safe. Why? Because within the Eurozone, the banks that lend to any Eurozone country, that's considered safe. You can fund that with board money. No conception that you might lose, even though they can lose, and they do lose. So the next time the Spanish government says, oh, I need my banks to lend to me, then the Spanish government and its banks will fail together. Uh, and of course, part of the sort of cycle there is that the European Central Bank can help the banks, but it can't help the government. So then the government will help the, the banks will help the government, and then they get supported by the, so it's a very bad system. Anyway, uh, it's, not pretty uh, when you look uh, and you get involved in this debate. You got lots of nonsense, you got lots of politics. And so uh, we wrote this book. Uh, <laughs> uh, we wanted to, first of all, remove the nonsense from the debate so that we expose them and therefore those that say them or those that, get, that fall for them uh, have a harder time uh, sort of uh, maintaining their story and, uh, and get are challenged because they seem to not be challenged enough for this nonsense. So the level of the debate at least would be elevated. If we're missing something, let's hear it. So far, I haven't heard anything. In other words, when I say, why shouldn't banks have 25%, there was, in three years of asking this question, there was not one coherent answer I could get for that that made any sense. Uh, and in particular, we wrote it at this level because writing at a higher level didn't get us anywhere. We needed to get more people uh, informed. And also, a lot of the people opining actually don't know very much about it. So they don't understand the words and they don't understand the arguments. And so they can't, even if they want to, they don't know how to respond. So, uh, so, so, so Jeff Carlton was saying, oh, I wish we had that, a book like that when we, when we did Dodd-Frank, because of all the lobbying, they could uh, sort of respond. So now maybe that'd be better. But the other thing is that unless uh, somehow there's more, uh, more pressure from the public, it seems like this is a knotted system that uh, works for those in it. And again, when you see democracy at work, uh, it's a little bit, uh, it's a political science thing that I was not aware of, but you can see how interest politics works, this in this country or in general. Uh, how decisions are made and how the public can lose, uh, basically, from, uh, from those who have a particular interest in a decision, having more ability and uh, more incentives to, uh, to, to impact and how lobbying works and all of that. It's not pretty. Um, anyway, so uh, that's it. So we have a website and you can read all kinds of things there. That's it. Now I'm open for questions. Uh, they, they, ask, they ask that you go to the microphones, so. Uh. Hi. Um, you mentioned the tax shield and the implicit subsidies, the reason why the creditors don't care about the risks that the banks are taking, uh, or why they undervalue that risk. Um, why don't the equity, why doesn't the equity seem to care in the run-up before the, the crisis? Thank you. So the question is who's equity? So the, the shareholders, the owners, are basically benefiting from, uh, they, they take all the upside uh, and, and they also save on interest. So in the book, when we explain guarantees and subsidies and how they work, we, through the book we take, uh, we take you through everything we can, uh, all the, a lot of the points we make through just a home bore. Uh, her name is Kate and she borrows to buy a house. And in the chapter on guarantees and subsidies, she has an aunt called Claire. Uh, 
So, uh, so Aunt Claire is going to guarantee her, her mortgage. And instead of paying 4%, she cannot pay 3%. So already she saves on interest right there. And of course, should the house go down and she has a non-recourse loan so she can be like a corporation and walk away, then her aunt has to come in. And the bank, of course, as a creditor, doesn't care because the bank gets paid the 3% anyway. So uh, however, whatever happens to the house, the, the creditor gets paid. Now, Kate benefits from this and so you case like the the, the, the shareholder because uh, because she saves on the interest and then of course uh, when when the when the uh, if she if she had to put the money more money in uh, or if the house goes down she would lo lose and now she, the, her aunt loses her aunt loses so as a result also the bank doesn't care how much equity she puts in, and she has an interest, of course, in putting less and less equity, and she could tell her aunt that equity is expensive. So now, shareholders in the banks, it depends who they are. The narrowest of shareholders are basically like Jamie Dimon. So those are the people whose entire wealth is in the bank. They basically uh, benefit at the expense of other people. So they prefer this. They would not voluntarily take down more downside risk on themselves. So they, they just... They just get subsidized, they get fed, because they, whatever is a residual, they get paid. So, so creditors are just even, they just have a fair return, and the shareholders get all the residuals. So whatever the bank benefits from, the shareholders benefit from collectively. However, diversified shareholders, so shareholders that have lots of stocks elsewhere, I argue, lose, because who pays for these subsidies is sort of all of us. So to the extent that we have pension investment, to the extent we're the taxpayers, to the extent we are harmed, you know, people are harmed by losing their jobs, the fragility of the system harms the diversified shareholders. So again, does the governance work for diversified shareholders? Apparently not. So somehow the governance of the banks is such that it serves the interests of the narrowest of shareholders. So when you say equity, you must mean some people. What are the market prices of equity? So presumably market. equity could be eliminated, but credit could be eliminated. So credit the, or not, you know, sense the, that I just don't understand why. Okay, so, so, so you need so you need to read the value of the equity is the value of, of what you of, of, of all the stream of cash flows that you would get from it. And that is uh, going to reflect the subsidies and everything. So that, that gets inflated basically relative to, because of the subsidies. So equity benefits from the subsidies and it gets reflected in the stock price. Should you remove the subsidies equity, uh, the stock price will go down. And, but it's, for, it's, for, it's correcting a, a, a distortion right now. Shareholders would not necessarily have incentive to change this. That's why we need regulation. So there's nobody within this system that will, from where they stand, want to change it. The shareholders are stuck in a place where the debt is already in place and they wouldn't want to take more downside. So that's the debt overhang effect. And you have to pull them out of there. So you have to force them to uh, basically. But it, th this is all within, within the system. So if Jamie Dimon uh, has you know, stock worth less, I think he's OK. Uh, he can take that. Yes? Thank you for coming, Professor. Uh, so I'm. I'm not going to argue that the it's the equity. I'm sorry, the capital requirement should be below 20 or 25 percent. What are some of the? I was wondering if you could outline the factors that mean it shouldn't be higher than 20 or 25 percent. Why is why why shouldn't it be 50, 80 percent? No, that's a good question. I'm always asked. Sometimes it's a, in the form of a cheap shot. Oh, you're saying this, and why aren't you saying higher? Well. Um, the truth of the matter is we don't have, it's very crude. We don't have, I mean, you know, 40, 50 would be okay too. Uh, at some point, basically, so it's, it's like the benefits are very high as you go up, but then they kind of subside. So it kind of matters less once you get to the safe level. So, uh, so you know, think of it, if you think of it as speed limits, you know, you kind of get them crude and safe. Uh, in the case of speed limits, it could be sort of too slow. Uh, here, you know, it's reshuffling of pieces of paper, so why not even more? And some people say 40 to 50% sounds good. But says, you know, I have friends who make me look like I'm so moderate because I, we only say 20, 30%. The problem with the numbers in any case is what's the denominator? So you can see the accounting systems are going to already make these numbers meaningless. Uh, 
do you net derivatives or not net derivatives, you know, can make a huge difference. So JP Morgan Chase, again, it's like almost half, it doubles. So the so 20% of, of, of what's the denominator. So it, it's, it's accounting systems and it's what's off the balance sheet and what's not. So the numbers are very tricky, what they mean. So that's why I'm just saying it's, a, it's sort of a caveat about, I don't know where to stop, I know what to do now. So I know the direction, and when we say 20 to 30%, we just mean to say a lot more than three. And so uh, I think that kind of makes that point pretty clearly. So we kind of take a range of numbers, and we're saying to keep it in that range, so it's not to a number. You know, sometimes they talk about a number and keeping to a number. So Charles Goodhart, who's a banking expert in, in UK, talks about the, the taxi cab paradox. So you have regulation that says that there must be a taxi in the train station all the time. And you could get to the train station at three in the morning and the one taxi there can't take you because then there won't be a taxi in the train station. So it has to absorb losses if you just have it so that it, it's there for the regulators. You know, so we want to keep it going. So therefore you don't have to sell assets to kind of as you lose. So you want to keep it between 30 and 20%, which is sort of like between the four and a half and 7% that Basel says. So that when it goes below 30, you're kind of in a conservation uh, sort of buffer and you kind of don't pay out and you kind of build it up and then as you... So what we say about that is that historically before safety nets, those were levels that banks even had, even though I agree, I think, that banks were still undercapitalized then. And in the rest of the economy, it's absolute minimum. So we're saying, okay, let's just get to kind of what's minimal in the rest of the economy and, and sort of, you know, start there. But, you know, since I can't get anywhere near there, I mean, Brown Vitter is 15%, they're screaming about that, or eight. It's a 15% is only for the largest six. Uh, so, you know, the 20, 30% is still a tease, uh, but you certainly, I, I don't have a good answer for you. Yes? A few years back, I was taught that the Federal Reserve always set the reserve requirements for all the United States banks 10% or above. Now, money always draws the most corrupt people. So can't the Congress just pass a law that there has to be a reserve above a certain level, like 15%? Well, this is not reserve. Remember, this is not reserve. This is equity funding. So reserve is what sits idle. They, you have reserve requirements, but, uh, but that's something else. Yes, brown water is precisely this. So right now, there's a bipartisan bill out there uh, called Brown Vitter, and Brown Vitter uh, um, requires 15% to the largest banks, and uh, and that is something that the regulators can do already, but they just well, can't don't. Can't the Congress just pass a law that they have to do it? Yeah, it, it, it can. It just doesn't yet. Well, and what is our chances of getting them to do it? You have to get rid help of me scream. You have to get rid of revolving doors, and you cannot. That's right. That's right. Not let a regulator be associated at any time in his life with a bank. That's, that's, uh, it's a problem. They go from politics, uh, there's a big revolving door. That's part of the problem. It's a capture. Yep. Yep. Well, something I was wondering is whether you have addressed in the book who would buy this equity, actually, because it's like, a, I mean, given the size of the, of the assets, it's a huge amount of equity. So in yeah, my yeah. view, if our other banks, you will have interrelated participation yeah. and eventually the banks would be still exposed to one to another. If our small investors, even assuming that there is a market so big for mm -hmm. this equity, mm -hmm. you will probably reduce the little incentives that there are now to monitor. So still, because like little and big small investors don't monitor, whereas the mm -hmm. big creditors, mm -hmm. big banks monitor a little bit, not that much. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is not to say that like, of course, subsidies are better. But maybe resolution tools like hard cut and conversion into equity of like some investors that have the capability of monitor of monitoring could be more attractive in this view. I don't know what's your <coughs> well. It's uh, I will probably have to quit, and so but this is not a good answer that I can give you in a short time. But uh, no, uh, equity always comes from end investors, so the banks are not any different. The equity markets are the same for everybody. The pieces of paper are the same for everybody. Uh, if the banks, uh, the, the, the amount of equity are relative to their current size, the current size is probably too big. So they'll have to shrink, which is fine. So that's a feature, not a bug. Uh, the point is that the same considerations apply. We don't need magic securities that will convert. Uh, 
the same governance that everybody deals with, they can deal with. There is nothing special about banks. All these things you said uh, suggest that in your head you think they're special, but I... It's not just special, just like the size of the... As so the size of the bank. This transition. Oh, the transition. So you're talking about the transition. The transition, they say, retain your earnings. And raise equity in the property prices? From whom? If you can't, back to my fastest. If you can't, something's wrong with you. There's a price. A price appropriate for your shares, including the downside. What's the price at which you can raise equity? If you can't, then, then that means nobody's going to give you a dollar for your upside and downside. Something's wrong with you. So in other words, that means you're insolvent. For new investors, they have to come in at appropriate prices. If the bank is viable, there is a price. Yeah, sure. That's it. That's it. I rest my case. There's a price there, investors. For, there's no smell or taste that's different. These are pieces of paper that give you rights to upside and downside. Investors don't care what their name written on them. It's their whole portfolios. And the end risk in the economy, and I could show you the big picture, but this is, not, this is kind of a basic seminar. The end, in, the end risks are borne by and investors. In other words, all the investments in the economy, all the risks in the economy are borne by somebody. And so there's nothing special about, about the bank's shares. They can have more assets for all I care. So but is it, is it, does your view involve the possibility that other banks buy those equity? The banks don't buy each other's equity. Okay. That's, that's not, yeah. I mean, you're right that there isn't an issue about what's f sort of fresh equity. But there's much more of a problem with debt. Any kind of debt, if you have a triggers and all of that, they, it becomes an issue who, ba who holds it. Obviously, you know, but, but banks do not have a, a bit of each other's equity. That's not, equity comes from outside investors. And that's where it should come from, pension funds, everybody else. Uh, no problem there. In other words, if, it, if there is an equity, then there shouldn't be the business. I mean, that's basically uh, the, the reality of it. And so if they don't have a business, then they shouldn't, uh, you know, Jamie Dimon says uh, that 15% equity is a nail in his coffin. And then, you know, you wonder about, Having a funeral, if that's the case. If he can't live with 15%, you know, then he says, oh, I gotta compete with the European banks. That's what he says. That's not a priority, I'm sorry. You know, my co-author was always in the uh, Monopolies Commission in Germany, and he said, oh yeah, the electricity company is gonna come and say, we have to compete with the, with the uh, French electricity company, so both of us can overpay for this UK power company. In other words, you can throw money at any industry and they'll succeed against competition. So that's not what we're in the business for. This is not the Olympic Games where they're going to win medals. You know, this is competition with other industries in the economy. If they, all the smart people go to banks, then why don't they go to other companies? It's not clear. That's part of the distortion, is that if they're bloated with subsidies, they take the smart people. And so that's not necessarily good for the economy. I think we have to probably finish, and I'll be happy, I'll be happy to stick around a little bit longer. Uh, um, I, we lost our chair here, but I was <laughs> so I know where he, has, where he has to go to the high school, but I, maybe I'll take one more question. Hi. Um, so we know that if we increase, actually, Professor Klausner in our class, we were just talking about uh -huh. this today. So if we increase the equity to debt ratio, mm -hmm. we're going to decrease leverage, which means yes. that we're going to increase, uh, which means that we're going to decrease the, the risk facing yeah. bondholders and facing shareholders, yep. but we're also going to increase the number of shareholders, correct? So how do we know then that the reduction in risk is going to offset the reduction, That's the yeah. ROE reduction? Chapter 7 and 8. Okay. <laughs> I, only read, I only read one. I'm not going to explain this in five minutes. It takes a couple of classes and, uh, and it, it, it took two chapters but to explain. Offset. Well, none of it except for the subsidies. Right. Uh, yes. That's it. That's yeah. it. And, and the debt overhang, you know, in other words, from whose perspective? But from the perspective of the total balance sheet, just the subsidies. Okay. So you're not gonna the risk is settling. The risk is going to be born in the balance sheet. That's the issue, unless it's born outside. And we want to remove, we want to remove the outsiders from bearing risk. So if, as long as it's in the balance sheet, it's fine. If, if to the extent that we're reducing subsidies, then, you know, the, 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 the risk adjustment will be a little different. But it, 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 the return adjustments are just as appropriate basically. You can read, uh, this is basic. this is the corporate finance part that people get confused about, so that's partly why, you know, they'll say some things, but two chapters in the book. <laughs> All right, thank you.